Well, welcome and congratulations. Um, today we're going to be talking about safe summer parenting. My name is Annie Zimmer. I'm one of the pediatricians at the Boys Town Clinic on 144th and Pacific. Um, there's lots of things we could talk about today for safe summer parenting, so I'm going to uh, try and focus on younger ages and um, anticipating a lot of you are expecting babies or have new babies, so we'll try and cover those things especially. So no talk about summer camp or ATVs or anything like that today, but just some of the newborn toddler basics. So the things that we do want to talk about today are some sun protection, water safety, bug spray, and how to prevent bug bites and stings, and then how to keep your kid hydrated and safe in the heat. We'll talk about maybe some noisy summer activities and how to protect your child from those things, as well as some travel. So first of all, um, we want to keep the baby out of the sun, um, especially in the first six months. So the American Academy of Pediatrics um, recommends that you just not use sunscreen in the first six months of life and really just try and avoid direct sun exposure. So you can do this by using umbrellas and canopies or um, kind of like screen tents when you're spending extended periods of time outside. Um, wide brimmed uh, baby hats are pretty common and easy to find and are recommended. Uh, and actually having your kid in um, long sleeves and pants is probably a good idea just to avoid direct sun exposure. Um, so some lightweight long sleeves uh, and pants for your newborn would be a good idea. If you cannot avoid sun exposure um, prior to six months, you can use sunscreen, but again, we just don't want um, you to default that the sunscreen is going to cover them. So um, if you are using sunscreen, and certainly after six months of age, we want you to be using sunscreen, uh, the recommended SPF limit is at least 15. It, most of the pediatric based or targeted um, sunscreens out there are going to be SPF 50, um, which is fine. So anything above 15 really should be good. You want broad spectrum, which is going to be just about anything you find in the store, but it's something just to be sure of because we want to cover both UVA and UVB rays. Um, UVB is what causes the burns, um, but you need UVA protection to prevent skin cancer. Um, sunburns early in your life are your biggest risk for uh, skin cancer later in your life, so it's really important to protect our kids from extended uh, sun exposure. Uh, the sun's intensity is peaked between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., so I think sometimes those early morning hours surprise people about how much sun uh, their kids actually got during that time, or not uh, early morning, but late morning hours. So I really encourage my patients, if you anticipate that your kid's going to be outside more than 15 minutes um, during that time, you should just be putting sunscreen on them. And sunscreen, a lot of them are at their peak performance 30 minutes after you put them on. So um, maybe even being a little bit proactive before you go outside um, to get it on. And then it should be reapplied every two hours or if your kid's in the water or getting really sweaty or toddler running around, then you should reapply more frequently than every two hours. Um, there is, um, again, most of the pediatric sunscreens out there would be fine. You don't have to get too obsessed about um, contents. There is one ingredient out there called oxybenzone that um, people have some concerns about that it may have some like hormone effects. So that might be something to read an ingredient label on and potentially avoid. Um, zinc oxide is a common ingredient in sunscreen and that is extremely effective, but that tends to be on the sunscreens that don't um, rub in very well, so your kid just looks white or creamy when they wear it. So that's sun. Let's talk about water a little bit. So water needs to be taken very seriously. Small amounts of water in a kid without motor skills to defend themselves from it can be dangerous. So consider one to two inches of water for your baby or toddler to be dangerous. I always think just always have a hand on the baby no matter what. So even in the bathtub or in the baby pool, it doesn't seem like a big risk, but it potentially is. So always a hand on the baby or never out of arm's reach for a toddler. If you have a pool, it's worth it to think about how safe your pool is. I think, you know, some cities have ordinances about this. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has really good uh, suggestions about how to fence your pool, like don't have your fencing attached to your home where your child can get out of, 
uh, sliding glass door um, and get into the pool. Don't store toys around the pool because that might entice a toddler to go wandering and, and play with the toys. Um, and then the fence, like how high should your fence be? They say four feet high for the fence with no more than four inch gaps on the fence. And then the latch should actually be higher. So you have to put in a taller gate than the minimum require of a, a fence. And then you want your gate to swing out away from the pool. They have all kinds of recommendations and they're just uh, helpful to reduce the chance that a kid's gonna slide in there and um, uh, risk a drowning. There's a lot out there about swimming lessons and these tend to be a popular mommy baby or parents and baby event for infants. There's not really research out there supporting that they're protective against drowning in kids less than one year of age. And, and I just saw a headline recently about a mom doing, like she posted a video and it got all this attention about her six month old prevented a drowning event with it. We don't really feel like that's a consistent thing. Nothing is reliable. Um, I would, if I signed up for an infant uh, swim lesson, I would just consider it a fun experience, shared experience with the child, not really any kind of protection for them. And even one to four years of age, we're not sure how, like statistically, how much safer your kid is with those um, swim lessons, but they may be beneficial. They may help your kid learn and understand the risks associated with water. And then after four years of age, we actually do recommend swimming lessons. But again, they, sh they should never be considered a security blanket that your child's safe from drowning. And then it's also worth considering signing up for a CPR class and learning CPR for your, for your children, not just for water safety, but choking safety and other things. So a lot of those are offered through the American Red Cross or um, through some of the hospital systems around town. So um, that was some water safety and what can kind of go with that is bug spray. So we also earlier um, talked about sunscreen and uh, I didn't include it on the slides, but there's a lot of products out there that combine sunscreen and bug spray and we don't really like those um, because we want you to be using more sunscreen and reapplying and we don't want repetitive use of those repellents. So having separate products for those is probably um, preferred. Um, in general, it's good to just reduce your risk or exposure to bugs if possible. I want people to certainly enjoy the outdoors and um, take their babies and infants outside with them. Um, but things you can do to redu reduce the risk of bugs would um, pay attention to what's in your yard. So any kind of bucket or flower pot or baby pool sitting out, you know, we don't want that for drowning risk. but. We don't want it for mosquitoes either, so bugs really like, or mosquitoes especially, really like uh, stagnant water. So avoid stagnant water in your yard. Maybe don't use too much scented, smelly perfumes, lotions, or sprays on your kids because they may attract insects. And along with that, bright colored clothing and floral prints may be attracting insects to your child, so keep those things in mind. We don't really get excited about the scented soaps and lotions in babies anyway because their skin can be kind of sensitive and some of those things can trigger rashes anyway. So just something to keep in mind. And then it's always good, especially those of you with toddlers that are out running around, to kind of check your kid head to toe after they've been outside for extended periods of time. So make sure they don't have any ticks. Chiggers are common in uh, they're tiny little mites that you can't see. So you, when people get chigger bites, they don't actually ever see the chiggers, they just show up. And those are more common in unkept grass areas or grass areas that don't get mowed regularly. So, you know, like maybe in a city park rather than a yard, you're gonna be at more risk. And those, it's best to bathe after extended periods of time outside to get those little tiny chiggers off because even after you come inside, they may still be on your skin and biting you or your child. So then bug spray. Bug spray prevents bugs that bite, like ticks, flies, mosquitoes, obviously, and chiggers. They don't prevent bee stings and hornet stings and whatnot. So you could just kind of have to pay attention to the floral prints and bright colors to prevent the stings. Bug sprays aren't really recommended in kids less than two years of age. The safety profile hasn't really been established there, but bug sprays with DEET are considered safe for kids otherwise. So after two years of, or two months of age, you can use a DEET-containing product. Uh, we usually 
limit that to about 30% deed or less. And a lot of the family products out there are gonna be more like a 10 or 15%. The higher rates or the higher percentages don't make it more effective. So if you have 10% deed on you, you're covered just as well as if you have 30% deed on you. It's just that the 10% deed might wear off in a shorter amount of time than the 30% deed. So those, you know, a lot of those outdoorsmen, it's kind of for those guys that are going into the woods for hours and hours. They have those high deed quantities in them. There's other things out there other than DEET that have been established to be somewhat effective, probably not as effective, and the safety profile on those isn't really well established either. So if you're opposed to DEET, you could consider some of these other things, but they may not be uh, as good. So um, picaridin, uh, eucalyptus, and soybean oil have been somewhat beneficial in protecting bug or preventing bug bites. Things we don't get excited about are the wristbands, oral supplements, backyard bug zappers, or um, ultrasonic devices for your yard. Permethrin is out there to prevent bug bites, but it is not safe for skin. So that's something we see that more like for people doing international travel, they'll have permethrin treated uh, clothing. Um, to prevent like malaria and whatnot. Um, But that's an option out there, but it is only intended for clothing use, not direct skin use. So what happens if your kid gets a bug bite? Um, You can always use like cold compresses just to reduce swelling and discomfort. That'll kind of slow the body's response to that insect bite. If your child's really itchy, you can always use over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream. Uh, That should be safe for any use on the body or anywhere on the body. I don't like the topical like um, Benadryl creams or calamine creams because that can uh, precipitate some skin reactions, especially if the child's exposed to sun. You don't want to cause a problem that wasn't there in the first place. You can use oral antihistamines, but in small infants, I'm pretty reluctant to do this. It's going to be for a kid that's really miserable, and I'd probably want to see a kid in the office before I'd recommend it. Um, For a little bit older child, you can always talk to the pediatrician about a dosing, too. Severe reactions to bug bites aren't common, but they are more common with like bees and things that sting. The reaction that is most scary is anaphylaxis, so that is a life-threatening reaction. Signs of anaphylaxis is breaking out in hives, vomiting, face swelling, difficulty breathing, wheezing, feeling faint, pale. If your kid has multiple of these, you should be calling 911. If it's just hives, you can call the doctor, but any of that other stuff, you should have a really low threshold to be calling 911. Other reasons you might want to just call the doctor associated with a bug bite or a sting is if you feel like it's quite red, um, the swelling is just increasing, your kid's developing a rash or fevers, then that it could be infected or um, your your child may have contracted an illness associated with the bug bite. So those would be reasons to call us. Or if you have any other concerns, we can always touch base about what's worrisome and what's not. Okay, so talking about the heat, that's another summer component out there that we all have to be thinking about. Newborns, when it comes to heat, we really want babies to only be drinking breast milk or formula. We don't like babies drinking extra water on top of that. So don't be keeping your newborn or two or four month old hydrated with water without talking to your pediatrician. An alternative would be Pedialyte that has you know, salts and sugars in it to help prevent a lowering of the salts in the blood. So it's a lot safer to do Pedialyte than straight water for a baby, but if your baby's needing continued Pedialyte, you should be talking to your doctor anyway. So just be mindful of hydration for your baby, you know, making sure that they're having wet diapers every six hours, those kinds of things that might be associated with getting a little too warm. After six months of age, babies can really drink water as much as they want to, and I actually encourage parents to have water readily available um, in those older infant um, months. But um, before six months of age, I would kind of use it cautiously. To help keep your kid cool, cotton clothing is probably a little bit more preferred than other synthetic fabrics that are out there. It's just more breathable, and that might help prevent heat rash, which is pretty common in infants. 
I put this on there because I always think of car seats. I don't know if you've had this experience yet, but when you take a baby out of a car seat on a warm day, their back is usually pretty wet because it's not very breathable. So when your kid's just sleeping in the car seat, just know that their body temperature is probably going up a little bit, um, especially in the summertime. So a word on cars and infants. Um, it's kind of a sad tragedy. Every year there's cases of kids that die in cars that are um, left in cars and lots of times unintentionally. Um, just be aware that the risk is quite serious. The car's temperature goes up pretty drastically in the sun, so within 10 minutes the temperature can be 20 degrees higher than it was when you left and lots of times we're already getting out of hot cars as it is. Um, and kids, they, their body temperature rises even faster than us adults, so we can't use ourselves as a gauge of how warm the child may be. Leaving a window open doesn't make it safe. So, you know, I think this happens all the time that you're out running errands with your infant and you get home and they're asleep in the car. It's so tempting to just not disturb them and check in on them frequently. But we always say, wake them up, take them with you. And then again, the unintentionalness that happens often with this, a lot of times it's a change in schedule where one parent's taking a kid to work or to daycare and that's not usually their routine or something like that. So I always encourage parents to put the important things um, like their wallet, purse, cell phone in the back seat with the kids so that when they get out of the car they are looking for their routine things as well as their child, especially when you're out of your routine. And it's probably just a good habit all the time. More about car seats. So probably during the summertime, you're gonna be taking some trips and traveling more. Probably you're gonna be traveling with your kid no matter what, whether it's summertime. So just a reminder about car seat safety. These are kind of cut and paste from the Nebraska laws. And there are a few more laws, but these are the ones that are more pertinent to parents with young children. Basically, all kids have to be in some kind of federally approved car seat until age eight. So plan on that in your budget for the next few years. Um, before age two, all children should be rear facing. And the caveat to that would be as if your kid is larger than your car seat manufacturer allows for rear facing. So a lot of them have lower parameters for to be rear facing and then higher parameters for forward facing. So if your kid has outgrown the rear facing guidelines of your car seat, then it's okay to flip them forward prior to age two. But most kids and most manufacturers are thinking of that two year mark in mind. And so most kids can stay rear facing until their second birthday. But the back seat is best. So if you don't have an option of a back seat, like you have a, a pickup truck or the back seat is occupied um, by other children, then a front seat is an option, but it's probably preferred for the older children. And then on the topic of travel, just a word about flying. The FAA lets you fly with children less than age two without buying a ticket, which is a, a enticing thing to consider a trip before a second birthday. Just know that the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, their official recommendation is it's best for the child to be in a car seat in the airplane if they're less than 40 pounds. And a lot of parents find that that extra room of the extra seat is to their benefit being on a cramped airplane. With an infant for flying, I get this question a lot. When is it too soon to fly? What do we need to do to prepare for flying? Um, COVID kind of changes our rules about this, or there aren't really rules, it's a judgment call. Um, really young infants may be more susceptible to serious infections, including COVID, so I might not be excited about a flight with a um, one-month-old versus a six-month-old. Um, regardless, if you are flying, you don't need to pre-medicate your child to get through the flight. You know, most of the time they will do just fine, so maybe anticipate the worst, but don't expect it. So things to pack, a pacifier, food, diapers, maybe some interesting new toys or even some new snacks for your kids that are old enough to snack. My first t experience traveling with my own child, we gave him Fruit Loops, which he had never had before, and he was enthralled with Fruit Loops the entire flight. So kind of having some tricks in your um, sleeve are, is a good idea. And then during landing and takeoff, those are the times where the ear pressure is changing. So having um, a pacifier or nursing the baby or a bottle during landing and takeoff can kind of prevent any ear discomfort that may trigger a rougher flight for you guys. 
Other kind of travel in that mind or summer activities is bikes. Bikes, you may not be thinking about this with your newborn, but if you're an avid bicyclist, this might be something that is interesting to you or the idea of taking your kid along. Prior to one year of age, we just don't feel like it's probably safe or that there's a safe way to do it. The child's motor skills really can't protect them should there be a crash of some sort. So um, I would avoid biking with infants less than one year of age. After one year of age, if you want to take your kids on a bike ride, a trailer would much be preferred than the rear mounted seat on the back of the bike. Um, and then if your child is on a bike ride, they should wear a helmet even though they're not pushing the pedal. So, or if they're on the tra in the trailer, um, the child trailer, they should also be wearing a helmet. And the way to know that you have a good helmet for your kid is if they have the CPSC seal on them. So there are like play helmets out there that'll circulate and you'll come across and just making sure that you have a real helmet that's designed to protect the child's head. You look for that CPSC. And then, especially if you're an avid bicyclist, you may have to tone it down a little bit with your kids. So don't take on busy streets. Maybe consider the park or um, trails that are less popular um, to avoid crashes and don't travel at maybe your regular speed. Slower speeds would definitely be safer should there be a crash. And then the other day I had a mom come up to me and she uh, asked about how soon her 18 month old could get a bike and I was kind of surprised by the ambition already, um, which I love the idea of getting your kids active, but uh, motor skill wise, we don't really feel like kids can be on a two seat or a two wheeled bike until about age five. They just don't have the neurological development to have the balance that's required with that. And even then they're gonna need the training wheels potentially till age seven. A trike is probably more appropriate prior to that. And I would think around age three and looking it up on the AP, that's what they actually recommended is consider tricycles around age three. You don't wanna get on them too soon because lots of times they can just get their legs caught and have injuries from the trike itself. Lots of summer activities involve some noise. So maybe you're a car racing kind of person or some events at the county fair that you would like to go to. Um, I, lots of these things may not be available to us this summer, but there's things to think of. Um, shooting sports might be popular in some families. Fireworks may be part of your summer celebration. So protecting your kids' ears from noise is something to be thinking about. And investing in a, in a set of earmuffs for your kids might not be a bad idea just for any activity that might surprise you about um, how much noise your kid is being exposed to. Kids will be a lot more sensitive to noise than adults are because their ear canals are small, so it allows kind of a, a little more pressure to build up in there. So louder noises will feel louder for kids. The research shows that 80 decibels is considered the threshold of when you start getting into damage range, which a garbage disposal or a food blender may be in that range. And short little bursts of this, not a concern. So you don't have to go put earmuffs on your kid to run the garbage disposal. But if your garbage disposal were to be running all day long or something that loud, it may be worthwhile to have some protection because bigger decibels is concerning, but also longer or prolonged exposure is the bigger risk to hearing loss. There's earplugs out there that we probably wouldn't get too excited about just because it could be a choking hazard for a toddler or infant. And then noise canceling headphones are getting to be popular and that would be okay as well. So I just wanted to end with a couple um, bullet points of the most important things that I think are worthwhile thinking about with your um, infants this summer and your young children. So again, we wanna avoid direct sun exposure prior to six months of age and just cover and keep in the shade. But if we need to, we're gonna use sunscreen and everybody over six months of age should be using sunscreen liberally. SPF 15 or higher is best. Always keep your hands on your infant or young toddlers when you're around water. Avoid bug spray before two months of age. D is considered safe in the lower ranges. Try and keep your baby cool. Avoid giving them excess water to drink in those first six months. And then rear facing in the back seat until age two is best. And last, get some earmuffs maybe for your noisy activities that you're gonna be doing with your kids. If you are interested in sending questions, um, go ahead and send them in on chat and we'll try and get some responses to you in the near future.